everyone, and welcome to the New York Historical Society. I'm Louise Mirror, New York Historical's president and CEO. And it is a really great thrill for me to see so many of you here in our beautiful Robert H. Smith Auditorium for this final History with David M. Rubenstein program of our Spring Public Program series. Tonight's program, as you know, features a conversation between Mr. Rubenstein and Cokie Roberts, whose most recent work, Capital Dames, shows how women in Washington during the Civil War transformed what was a sleepy, social southern city into a place of power and action. And now, please join me in welcoming our Thank guests. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, were you born with the name Cokie? Where did you get that name? <laughs> My name is Mary Martha Corrine Morrison Claiborne Boggs Roberts. That's a Jewish it's your name? Basic Southern, <laughs> <laughs> it's a basic Southern Catholic name. Thank you. Uh, my brother Tommy, who was three when I was born, could not pronounce Corrine and uh, dubbed me Cokie. But uh, so many people in New Orleans, my hometown, are named Corrine that we all have nicknames. Okay. So it's, my so, mother's name was Corrine, and she was called Lindy, so you figure that one out. <laughs> so, well, your mother was a very famous congresswoman, and uh, she succeeded your father, who had been House Majority Leader, and later your mother was also ambassador to the Vatican. Your brother was a very prominent figure in political life in Washington, and your sister was the mayor of Princeton. So how did you avoid getting into politics How did yourself? I go wrong? Right, yes. <laughs> how did that happen? Well, uh, I met my husband, Steve Roberts, who many of you have met, um, uh, between our sophomore and junior year of college, uh, at a student political meeting. So you know, it, was, it was a kind of natural um, path for me. But he was always going to be a journalist. And it would have been a little hard on him if I had gone into politics. Although there were many times uh, when I was covering Congress when I wanted to just get down in there and fix it. Um, you know, uh, but more, that was more maternal than anything else, you know? Okay. So um, the word history has the word HIS at the beginning right. of it. So the implication might be that uh, history is made by men and not by women. So what propelled you to think that there was a history that you could write about women in terms of the early days of our country, and then later we'll talk about the Civil War? What got you into this area? Well, first of all, as you might have noticed, I am a woman. Right. And um, <laughs> so that, uh, that got my interest going. Uh, but I had grown up in Washington in the 1950s and seen my mother and all of her uh, cronies, you know, Lady Bird Johnson and Betty Ford and all of them doing everything. Uh, they ran the political conventions. They ran their husband's campaigns. They ran the voter registration drives. Along with the African American women in Washington, they ran uh, social service agencies. Of course, they ran as kids. And I knew how incredibly influential they were and figured that the women from the founding period had to be at least as influential. And that period is such uh, an important part of our history, the crucial part of our history. And I wanted to know what those women okay. were. So, um when you wanted to do that, how did you begin? Did you go through the letters from that period of time? What, what were the resources that you had available? So the first book, and my wonderful editor, Claire Wachtel, is here. I don't see her, but she's here, and she and I did this together. Uh, the first book, um, I uh, had a really hard time finding the letters. Abigail Adams was easy, but for the others, uh, it really was detective work. And it starts in the early 18th century with the build-up to the revolution and then goes through the, um, the, nom the, the inauguration of John Adams, which was the first contested election under the Constitution. So that's founding mothers. And, um, and so it was hard. I mean, a lot of those women, you really had to search for letters. Martha Washington, as you know, David, burned her correspondence with George Washington. Thomas Jefferson burned his correspondence with Martha Jefferson. Um, and uh, so we did have the wonderful Abigail Adams letters. But aside from that, it was really just looking as hard as you could in, in historic societies and the Library of Congress and universities. Well, when you, uh, in your first book, when you're talking about the colonial uh, women who were very important to our country's Revolutionary War period of time, uh, you point out in the letters how articulate they were. Right. Although they hadn't gone to college, perhaps, they seemed to write letters better than the men. Much better. Much better. Man. 
the men's letters are, you know, they, they, they were very self-aware. They knew they were doing something extraordinary. And so their letters are studied and edited and pompous, and they, um, they expect them to be preserved and published. And so that's how they read. Um, the women's letters are letters, and they don't expect us to be reading right. them 225 years later. And so they just wrote, and they wrote politics, lots of politics, but they also wrote about fashion and about um, who was having babies and all too often losing children, about the economic situation. So you get a much more complete picture of American society. But also they're funny and frank, and they say things that you know the men don't say. The men do say in letters to the women things that they don't say in the letters to the men. For instance, John Marshall, uh, when he was riding the circuit, showed up in Raleigh, North Carolina, which was barely a town, and discovered that he had arrived there without any britches. And so he wrote to his wife and said that he was, uh, he was uh, very concerned because he couldn't find a tailor who could help him. And so he was going to have to spend the term without that essential article of clothing. And, you know, I can't look at him anymore, David. I have no I, I, So What was he wearing? I, you know, well, I avert my gaze. Well, they had those black robes that covered everything. <laughs> I guess everything. that's it. So, um, and you point out in your early books that the women spent a lot of time being pregnant. They were married very early. And as you just mentioned, they lost a lot of children. So that was a fact of life in the early days. Is that right? It was a fact of life, but it's not anything that anybody ever took for granted. It was devastating. One of the things that makes me, one of the many things that makes me crazy in looking at the past is that people think that they were different somehow, that these women weren't as uh, horribly affected by losing their children as a woman be today. And of course, that's just wrong. These were mothers. And you could lose a 10-year-old and a 3-year-old in the same week with some <coughs> disease came through. And it was, it was horrible. Now, one of the women you've written about, Martha Washington, our first first lady, um, you know, you, we tend to have a historical view of her. She's a nice, matronly type lady who didn't really spend that much time with George Washington. But you point out that actually she was with him in many of the, uh, on the encampments and actually was very essential to his life in ways that people didn't know about. Can you describe that? Well, she, I, I think that part of the reason we think of her as, you know, a nice little matronly sort is because most of the pictures we see of her are in old age. And she has that cap, which does her disservice. Uh, but, the, um, <laughs> but she was a beautiful young widow and the richest woman in Virginia. Uh, her husband, Daniel Park Custis, died and left her with, she had, they had had four children, left two living by the time he died. And uh, she really uh, didn't think that she wanted to remarry because, of course, a married woman couldn't own property. Uh, the property she owned was her was the property of her husband, and she was doing business. I mean, we do have some of those letters where she's writing to uh, the merchants in Great Britain about I'm now in charge of the money, and um, but then according to 19th century biographers, George Washington swept her off her feet, and uh, and she married him. Her wealth uh, had no appeal. Her wealth had some appeal. Um, <laughs> But I think they, they genuinely, uh, they, there are other letters of other um, observers, people who went to camp said the general is very pleased with his lady. They really love each other. And she, of course, the year that we all know about is Valley Forge, where it was they were starving and freezing uh, out near Philadelphia. But she was at camp every single winter of the eight long right. years of the Revolutionary War. And Washington thought she was absolutely essential to have at camp because she was so uh, crucial to tr troop morale. So she had a cat. <laughs> she had a cat in Morristown, yes. What was the she name of that aptly cat? aptly named the cat Hamilton. It, <laughs> it was a tomcat. Right. And um, so she had a sense of humor. And it was also a good thing that she was around because uh, they put on these great entertainments, again, to try to keep up troop morale. Right. And one night, uh, George Washington danced for three hours straight with the flirty and pretty Catherine Littlefield Green. So it's a good thing Martha was on here. 
So um, in the history of uh, presidents or almost anybody in our country, there's nothing quite like the thousand letters between John Adams and Abigail Adams. Right. So you, you've read those letters. Um, Abigail Adams' letters are more compassionate, more, right. more interesting. More interesting. And she, does she frequently say, I love you, John, and he says, I love you back? Or No, but, but she wants him to say that. And, uh, and she, at one point when he was in uh, Europe and she was in Massachusetts, and she was really having a hard time, you know, the, he, no money was coming in. She was having to try to eke survival out of the farm. She had four little kids. And, um, and she did have him send things, she would notice what was missing, and a lot of things were missing, so she'd have him send things like lace and handkerchiefs and stuff so she could make some money selling them. But he wrote these very stiff letters, and she said, I need some effusions of your heart. You're like a frozen Laplander. <laughs> and, um, and he was <clears throat> convinced that the letters would be intercepted and he would be ridiculed. And she basically said, don't worry about the British ridiculing you. Worry about me. Right. And, um, and she, she, was, she, she had a point, a very good point. She was by herself trying to make it all work. And a little, a little sign of love would have gone a long way. Well, the letters are extremely articulate, she wrote. She only had a second grade education, I guess, or something like that. Well, but she was educated in her father's parlor. Her father was a minister. And he uh, had students who came in. And those students uh, engaged her and her very interesting sisters. The set of, sets of letters among those three women are quite interesting. And so they, they, they got essentially a classical education. So one of the other founding fathers who had a complicated relationship with his wife was Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, Complicated is a nice word. So he <laughs> married someone, but then he seemed to have left her for 10 to 15 years. And how, was that, how did that work out? Well, you know, one of the things you learn, actually, apparently they don't learn it anymore because I've asked children this. The Children's Book of Founding Mothers, which is wonderful, by the way, fabulous illustrations, but it came out a couple of years ago. And I would ask the children what they knew about Benjamin Franklin. And they didn't know what I learned in elementary school, which was that he was the first postmaster general of the United States, except... I didn't realize until I was writing this book that he wasn't in the United States. He was in England. And he was there lobbying for Pennsylvania uh, with the British Parliament for a dozen years. And so his wife, Deborah, was left running the Postal Service and, and also running their printing businesses, which were like franchises, like Kinko's. And, um, and she, so they were. And, she, and at one point, the British nobleman who was the titular head of the uh, Postal Service, tried to fire one of her workers, who was, of course, her cousin. And she, um, she got furious. And she was barely literate. So her letters are not well written or, or grammatical. But the point gets across. And she said to him, you are ruining the postal system. You are, you are you know, slowing everything down. I've hired extra horses to make sure the mail gets through quickly. And you are just in my way. Get out of my way. And in the children's book, there's an illustration of her holding Lord Loudon in her hand, just right. telling him off. It's quite wonderful. So um, he was in England and France for about maybe 15 years. Um, was he very faithful at, during those <laughs> times? Well, he was in England for the period of time when she was alive, and um, and he moved in with a family, and we basically had a whole other family. And um, and she, he was very grateful to, for her business acumen, and you know said she ran things well, but she kept begging him to come home. And their only daughter got married, and he wrote and said, you know, keep the wedding cheap, right, you know, right. something. <laughs> Things don't change, and um, she, but he wouldn't come home. And she begged him and begged him. Finally, she died, and he said uh, he wrote to a friend and said, "My wife, in whose hands I left the care of my affairs, has died." So poor Ben had to right. go home. So what about somebody who's very popular now, Alexander Hamilton? Oh. What's the nature of his uh, relationship <laughs> with his wife? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm on record on Hamilton. Um, so Alexander Hamilton not only had this uh, very public, became public affair with Mariah Reynolds, uh, and of course that became public because her husband blackmailed him. And he then um, 
had to uh, basically go and go public to say that he was being blackmailed for reasons of a sexual nature rather than that he was doing something illicit with treasury funds. Um, and uh, his wife, Eliza Schuyler, stood by him. And he would have never made it otherwise. She was of very prominent two New York families, the Schuylers and the Van Rensselaers, and he was this illegitimate right. kid from the West Indies. And his marriage to her had made him in the first place, and then he cheats on her and it becomes public, and she ends up you know, standing behind him, supporting him. And actually, years later, I was talking about this, and it was after the Spitzer and McGreevy scandals, and, and both of their wives had worn exactly the same thing when they stood behind these men, when the men were admitting their perfidy. And, um, and they wore you know, the suit jacket and pearls, and so I was making some joke about Eliza Hamilton stood by and probably wearing pearls. And some clever woman in the audience sent me up a note and said, pearls behind swine. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, he probably also had an affair with her sister, Angelica Church, who, who got around. And, um, and then, from my perspective, the worst thing he did was go have that duel. You know, his son had been killed in a duel. His daughter had lost her mind as a result of it. His wife has seven children, one of whom is going to require care for the rest of her life. And he challenges Aaron Burr to a duel and gets killed when uh, he has no money. And he's left his wife penniless with all of these children. So I don't like him at all. Well, well, what is your view of our third president, who was the first president, didn't have a first lady? What did he do for um, a hostess or...? Well, it, you know, it's always said that Dolly Madison was Thomas Jefferson's hostess, and from time to time she was. Um, she, when he first came to Washington, she and her sisters lived in the White House with him, and because, um, you know, it was a brand new town and there was nothing. Uh, but that turned out to be a problem because the press at the time you know, makes today's look tame. And uh, at one point, uh, it was written in one of the Federalist Papers that, that Jefferson had pimped Dolly Madison and her sisters in exchange for votes in Congress. So it was, it was not tame. And, um, but she, when she moved out, he would occasionally ask her to come back. And there, there are a couple of frantic letters, you know, Mrs. Madison, please come to the white, to my house right now, but there are women coming and I need you here. But he wanted his daughters to come. He had two daughters. And um, he particularly wanted them to come when the whole Sally Hemings scandal started to be written about in the newspapers, which was as early as 1802. And, um, uh, finally, they did come to sort of uh, put, a, put some of those rumors to rest. And then his older daughter, his younger daughter, died, Maria. His older daughter, uh, Martha, then came back for a period of time, had the first baby in the White House, James Madison Randolph. And the woman who was uh, attending her uh, said, to, said to Louisa Catherine Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife, she said, it was a disaster. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find towels. I couldn't get hot water. It was Bachelor Hall, she said. <laughs> he never invited Sally Hemings that we know up to the White oh, House. No, he never was there. That wouldn't have happened. That's not the kind of thing that would So um, Thomas Jefferson, as president, only made one public speech, his first inaugural address. He never actually spoke again in public. So he used the social occasions at the White House to communicate with people his views. So. That's why it was important to have a hostess or someone to help with those yes, roles. Yes, but he, he, had, uh, he was very partisan in his, uh, in his entertaining. He had Republicans one night and Federalists another night. And uh, so he could say different things to different people. Oh. Uh, but um, so the real entertainment uh, that happened in Washington at that point really went on at the Secretary of State. And so Dolly Madison, and it's wonderful that you're starting with her because she is an incredibly important figure in our history. She, um, she had entertainments at their house and the Federalists and Republicans both came. And at a time when the country was very partisan and regional differences, as you know, were just uh, already beginning to make the country fray. And it was way too young and way too fragile to sustain that. And she made people come together and, and 
uh, you know, have some cider and some wine and behave. And, um, and it really made a difference. Her, her squeezes, as they were called, because there were so many people there, um, you had to be there if you wanted to get political information or make political deals. So when her husband became president, um, well, let's talk about James Madison. He married relatively late. Uh, in life for about those days, and um, she had already been married before? She had married. She was a beautiful young Quaker girl. Her family had come up from um, North Carolina because the Quakers uh, had said no more slaves, and they couldn't make it, and so they came to Philadelphia. Her father was kind of a ne'er-do-well. Her mother ended up running a boarding house. Her first husband, who was a Quaker, um, died, and as did one of their their baby. It was a yellow fever epidemic, which went through Philadelphia constantly. So she was left this beautiful young widow with a baby, and one baby, and um, and a brother-in-law who tried to take her inheritance, and all of that kind of stuff went on all the time. But she stayed at her mother's, and James Madison saw her and was taken with her, and asked Aaron Burr to introduce them. And um, and so they started seeing each other, and um, and she wrote a letter on the day they were married at her sister's house. Her sister was married to George Washington's nephew, and um, she married at her sister's house and wrote to her best friend earlier in the day and signed it Dolly uh, Payne, and then she later in the day signed it Dolly Madison. Alas, so um, but she seemed to like him. So you point out in your book, in the 1830s, they uh, dedicated finally a monument to George Washington, and two of the most distinguished people who went were? It was actually 1848. It was that late. Uh, so that's where the book begins, is 1848 right. with the dedication right. of the Washington Monument. And she, Dolly Madison, had after James Madison died in 1836, she came back to Washington, which she was dying to do. Being stuck out at Mount Pelia didn't right. work for her at all. And um, and she, I'm going tomorrow. It's you know, you know, David, right. you've been right. so kind to it. It's not right there. And um, so she came back to town. She had a terrible ne'er do well son who used up all of her resources. All that any time Congress would pay for Madison's works, the kid would debtors would come and all that. So she was really impoverished, but lived uh, right across from the White House. One of her former slaves helped support her. Um, but she was, even in her uh, state, she was very revered, incredibly revered. And uh, she had a seat of her own in the House of Representatives. She was, uh, any head of state who came to Washington called on her. Uh, president sought her advice all of the time, all of that. So. So when it was when they finally thought they had enough money together to start building a monument to George Washington, which, as you know, they had talked about from the 1790s right. on, um, they asked her, Anne Eliza Hamilton, uh, to head the fundraising effort for the women and uh, and Louisa Adams, but she was in Boston. So there in 1848 were Dolly Madison and Eliza Hamilton. Uh, at the dedication of the Washington Monument, very much uh, recognized in their role as the relics of the founding. And it really brought um, everyone back, and the newspapers are clear of the time are clear about it, uh, back to the time of the founding. Here were women who knew these men intimately, right. and um, at a time when the country was together. Uh, right before the right. Civil War when it was starting to fall apart. Before we get to the Civil War, one other First Lady I'd like to have you comment on. That's Louisa Adams, who you just mentioned, who was John Quincy Adams' uh, wife and the, the I guess, daughter-in-law of uh, Abigail Adams. So what was she like? She was a very interesting person. Somebody asked me recently who, what uh, historic First Lady Jackie Kennedy was most like. And I think in some ways Louisa Adams is the answer to that question. She was born abroad. Her father was American. Uh, 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 her mother was English. And um, her father was the consul in uh, London. And then during the Revolutionary War, got his family out. It wasn't a good place to be and, um, for an American, so brought him to France. And so she had a very European upbringing. And then they went back to London, where she met uh, John Quincy Adams as he was coming through. Uh, on his way to a diplomatic assignment uh, in Germany. 
and um, and they dated in the way one did. And and then he said that he was he was going to marry her, but he wasn't sure whether it was going to be in a month or seven years. And um, and in the meantime, would she please study all of these books and all that? So it was it was quite something. But he did come back and marry her. Her father then lost all of his wealth, and for the rest of her life, she thought that that uh, people thought that she had kind of trapped John Quincy Adams into this uh, marriage where she didn't have any any money, any dowry, anything. And she she suffered with that. But she went with him uh, to the courts of Europe, which she was very popular, and, uh, and finally did come to America after uh, John Adams' presidency was over, and met her in-laws for the first time and found that very difficult. Um, first of all, they were up in you know, Braintree, Massachusetts, and she thought it was just an odd assortment of people. But also, Abigail had no use for her. You know, she was this European girl who seemed awfully frail, and um, she didn't think she'd last very long anyway. But um, they finally did make peace, and um, Louisa spent a lot of time in Washington. John Quincy was in the House and in the Senate. And then finally, um, after Abigail died and John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State, uh, Louisa and old John Adams became very close. Yeah. And she, um, she wrote him these wonderful letters from Washington uh, when John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State. And they're these gossipy, fun letters that she writes to John Adams to keep him amused. And one of my favorites is one, it's actually one of my favorite letters of all the letters of women that I've read, which is of the year 1820, and it's the year of the Missouri Compromise. And Congress stayed in session longer than usual to hammer out the compromise. And so uh, finally, Congress finally adjourns. She goes to a meeting of the trustees of the orphan asylum that Dolly Madison had helped establish after the British invasion. And she gets there, and one of the other trustees says to her, we're going to need a new building. And she said, what? Why are we going to need a new building? And the woman said, well, Congress had stayed in session very long and had left 40 cases that would be in need of our institution. And she said, what? Well, it turns out Congress had left behind 40 pregnant women. Right. And there were only 187 members of Congress at the time. Now, you know. Some of them might have been recidivist, I don't know. But, um, but she was so furious, and she says to her father-in-law, I recommended to the next session for that great and moral body to take the two additional dollars a day that they have given themselves as an increase in pay and should uh, move that it be um, used to fund our institution. So it's pretty fabulous stuff. <laughs> so let's go forward to the Civil War period, the period of time you talk about in, in Capital Dames. Um, at the beginning of the Civil War, pre-Civil War period of time, James Buchanan is President of the United States, our only bachelor president. So did he have a hostess, or how did he do entertaining? His niece, Harriet Lane, uh, was his hostess. Uh, the, he, she had been with him uh, part of the time when he had been in England as the ambassador to the court of St. James. And she was wildly popular in England. Queen Victoria loved her, named her an honorary ambassadress. Uh, she was courted by all of the men of England. And one of her friends wrote to her and said, you really ought to marry over there because uh, nobody here is going to you know, be good enough for you. But she didn't. And she came back. And she uh, did run the White House. Uh, she was actually the first person referred to in the press as First Lady. And that's probably because she wasn't a wife. They didn't know what to call her. But, but she, she, the other women write about her as basically she did her job. Um, she did what she was supposed to do, but they, nobody felt warm and cozy about her. So can you explain what people used to do in those days? They felt like they had to call oh, on yeah. other people. Explain the calling concept. You had to call. You had to call. My, that, this was still true, actually, when my mother came to Washington. Uh, at age 24 as a congressional wife in, in 1941. It's World War II that stopped it. And when she got there, um, it, she, she always told the story. You had to, and I'll, I'll get the days wrong, but you had to call on the Senate on Monday, the House on Tuesday, the 
cabinet on Wednesday, the court on Thursday, and receive on Friday. So you, you call, you just went and... You have went and presented your card, and, um, and uh, with any luck, nobody was there, and you could present the card and leave. But, um, but it was absolutely required, and there was a huge amount of etiquette uh, in the time of these women of who called first and all of that, and it could cause, it could cause diplomatic uh, incidents if you got it wrong. So in 1860, Abraham Lincoln is elected. His wife is Mary Todd Lincoln. Was she somebody that the people in Washington knew or respected, or what did they think of her when they first met well, her? Well, they didn't like him, you know. Uh, I think he got 2% of the vote in Virginia and 3% of the vote in Maryland. And those are the cities, or the states around Washington, which was basically a Confederate sympathizing city. And they assumed, the women there assumed that she was a coarse Western woman, which was unfair, but that is what they assumed. And they were not uh, inclined to like her anyway. But then she made it really easy not to like her um, because she was very difficult. She um, she would probably say today she was bipolar. Uh, she had enormous swings of mood. She had terrible temper tantrums. She had very strong views about people and did not hide them, and not many of them were favorable. Um, she had an absolute inability to uh, stop shopping. I mean, she was a true shopaholic. She'd come here to New York and and buy up stores with the press following her every place she went and writing it all down. Uh, but she still Who was paying did. for all this? Well, she was went into debt, and uh, it became very important to her that her husband be reelected because she was terrified that he would find out and the country would find out that the debt that she had accrued. So I thought sometimes there were congressional appropriations for fixing the White House. There were covers that she would steal. Um, and they were, that's true. She would take things from the White House appropriations and use them to cover her expenses. And then at one point, she blamed the gardener, uh, things like that. Uh, so she, she also uh, leaked the State of the Union message, uh, one, of the, one of the president's State of the Union messages, and uh, to the New York Herald, I guess. And there was some... Uh, speculation that she did it for favorable coverage, some that she was having an affair with the editor. There was all kinds of speculation. But it became a congressional investigation, and the president had to go to the Hill and um, say, you know, that is, please don't subpoena my wife because it would be so embarrassing, and because it was a Republican Congress, they agreed not to subpoena her. But there was a huge investigation of her private server. Wasn't there also criticism that she might be a Southern sympathi sympathizer? But there was a lot of uh, sense that she was a Southern sympathizer because all of her brothers and half-brothers and brothers-in-law fought in the Confederate Army. But she was not. That's an unfair uh, criticism. So um, on the fateful night uh, Ford's theater, um, she, the original intention had been to invite uh, Ulysses S. Grant and his wife, Julia. What, why did they not attend uh, that event? Mrs. Grant made it very clear that she was not going to the theater that night. And <clears throat> when Mrs. Lincoln tried to summon her to the theater, uh, Mrs. Grant got message, a message to her husband and said, we are leaving now. Uh, we're going home. We haven't seen the children in a long time. You know, So uh, they got out of town, which was very fortunate for them. But what had happened was is that um, at Julia Grant's suggestion, she had uh, convinced her husband, before the war was completely over, to invite the president and, and Mrs. Lincoln to camp where they, were, uh, where they had set up camp outside of Richmond, City Point. And she thought the president looked so tired and thin that he would enjoy getting into the country, getting out with the soldiers, which he did like. And also, the Lincoln's son was there. And so they, uh, Mary and, and Abraham Lincoln went to City Point, and they were entertained by the Grants. But then there was a brouhaha because Mrs. Lincoln got to a, a reviewing stand late and saw another woman riding, a general's wife, riding with her husband. And she had a fit and screamed and yelled, and it became very embarrassing. And so she went back to Washington. And then when they came back after Richmond fell, um, Mrs. Lincoln would have nothing to do with Mrs. Grant. And she had a party, Mrs. Lincoln had a party on the ship they were staying on. 
and didn't invite Julia Grant, who was on a ship right next door in the James River. And so Mrs. Grant hired the Marine Band and went up and down the river and had the band play You'll Miss Me When I'm Gone. <laughs> and so, so um, there was no love lost there. And fortunately for General Grant, uh, Mrs. Grant refused to go to the theater. So had General Grant been there that evening, maybe the outcome would have been different. Right. So um, after President Lincoln is assassinated, um, Mrs. Lincoln is given some time before she has to leave the White House. But some people say she took all the possessions in the White House and took them back to auction them off. Is that true? No, that's not fair. They, she did a lot of things wrong, but not everything. Uh, and what did happen, first of all, um, she had spent a great deal of money uh, making the White House beautiful by her lights. Um, and over the course of the presidency, people, everybody felt free to come to the White House. People would just come to the White House. In fact, what I love is how these women walk into the White House, regardless of whom is president, and just tell him off. You know, it's just unbelievable. They march in and have words with the president. It makes me so jealous, I can't even tell you. But the, so, but so, so anybody could just walk anybody in? Anybody could do it. And so people who came to these overcrowded receptions at the White House would take souvenirs. I mean, there's one story in here of a woman just taking scissors and cutting out a tablecloth-sized piece of a drapery. Um, so when Mary, when Abraham Lincoln was killed, Mary Lincoln went crazy and took to her bed for weeks. And during that time, there was nobody in charge at the White House. And so other people did come I in see. and sack the place. But she did not do that. So after the assassination, of course, Andrew Johnson becomes president. But uh, one of the issues that had to be dealt with was what happened to the uh, head of the Confederacy. And he was put in jail, Jefferson Davis. But his wife was a very prominent figure. How did she become uh, so influential and stayed with Jefferson Davis, even though she really was from the North, I think? Well, her grandfather had been governor of, Pens of, Philly, of, of New Jersey, uh, but she grew up in Natchez. Um, but Verena Davis is one of the most delightful people you'd ever want to meet. And um, she had been in Washington before the war and a very prominent woman in Washington. He had, he had been in Pierce's cabinet and then in the Senate. And um, she, she loved her time in Washington. She talked about it for the rest of her life. She had made fast friends. Um, she just enjoyed the political life enormously and then had to leave when they seceded and got to Richmond and knew that this was a fool's errand. She wrote to her mother and basically said, you know, we don't have the manufacturing, we don't have the railroads. You'd think the men might have noticed. And, uh, and she said, but I will play my part. And in the same way that Mary Lincoln was not fully accepted, she was not fully accepted. Um, partly because the fine old families of Virginia didn't like these people coming in for, to form a government, but partly because she was suspect. Uh, they thought she was a northern sympathizer. And she was not uh, fair-skinned enough for a perfect southern beauty. So one of the Richmond papers referred to her as tawny. And um, in fact, much later in her life, after she had the war happen and she did come to Andrew Johnson and get Jefferson Davis out of jail and all of that. They had a very troubled marriage. He was awful. And, uh, and so she, finally he died. And um, she moved here to New York to work for the New York world. And uh, she was dying to do it. First of all, she needed the money. But secondly, she wanted out. She wanted out of the lost cause and all of that. And uh, it was a huge scandal. The first lady of the Confederacy moving to New York City. And she wrote to her daughter and said, I am free, brown, and 64. I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> and then she did come here, and she was quite a personage. Uh, and one of the things she did, though, was befriend Julia Grant. And that was page one news in every newspaper in the country, that the wife of the president of the Confederacy and the wife of the general who defeated the Confederacy had met. And then they continued to meet. And uh, Verena Davis went to the dedication of the Grant Memorial. And she knew what she was doing. What she was doing was working to bring about right. reconciliation. And that's what a lot of these women did when the war was over. So uh, all the women you have 
written about. If you had a chance to have dinner with one of them, who would you find to be the most appealing? So dinner, you know, is one thing, because some of them would just be delightful to have dinner with. So Verena Davis certainly is in that category. She's always talked about as a great conversationalist. Um, from the earlier period, Sarah Livingston Jay, Sally Jay, uh, just wrote wonderfully funny letters and, um, and also from her menus had good food. And, um, and uh, Dolly Madison probably, although she probably would have been guarded because she wanted, she was so clear that she she had a role to play, and in fact, at one point, Henry Clay said to her, everybody loves Mrs. Madison. And she said, well, that's because Mrs. Madison loves everybody. Now, I have read her mail, it's not true. Right. But, um, so she might have been more guarded, but um, there are other women in this book, a fabulously interesting woman, Virginia Clay, who was married to an Alabama senator. There, I mean, lots of people you like to have dinner with, and then there are other people who you admire, like Clara Barton, Dorothea Dix, Abigail Adams, who are really admirable women. So of all the letters that the women wrote that you, read, you uh, wrote about, there's one that's very famous, Abigail Adams sending a letter to uh, John Adams at the Second Continental Congress saying to remember the women. What was she talking about? So they were, the men were trying to decide what to do about um, Britain. And uh, from her perspective, they were taking way too long and were way too lily-livered. Um, she, she kept saying, declare independence, for God's sake. What's wrong with you? And um, meanwhile, she's back in, in Braintree with these little children and um, you know, trying to keep body and soul together. And oh, by the way, the British are coming. At, at one point, in fact, John wrote to her and said, if it gets really dangerous, take our children and fly to the woods. You know, Thank you, John. Um, <laughs> Hope, hope you're having a nice dinner in Philadelphia. But, um, but she, she was very you know, interested in the cause and uh, very much a patriot. And so as she started thinking about it, she said, well, if, if we do, when you finally do declare independence, you're going to have to come up with a new code of laws. And when you do, remember the ladies, because all men would be tyrants if they could. And he laughed at her and basically said, you know, we, we already have petticoat rule. Um, it's the only time he really laughed at her, but he did laugh at her. So in those days, the idea that women would have the right to vote never was talked about by any of these women? Or? She talked about it. She, so, so there were women like Catherine McCauley in Great Britain who was writing about women and the vote, and these women all read that. And then, of course, when Mary Wollstonecraft came out with her treaties, uh, everybody, it just flew across the Atlantic. And um, so there was, they, they didn't really militate for it, but they talked, they, they made a side. So Abigail Adams would say, well, if I can't vote, I can at least give my opinions, things like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't right. absent from their thinking. And you're thinking about doing a book on this subject in the future? Well, just keep in mind that the centennial of suffrage is coming up. Okay. So uh, you have known many of the First Ladies in your lifetime, um, your, your parents or yourself. Um, how does the First Lady uh, operate today much different than they did back in the th your period? I actually don't think it's that much different. I mean, they don't have to worry about the calling, but they right. do have to worry about uh, getting it right with the right people, and particularly with the international community. Uh, I think that these women from the beginning have been very politically interested and have usually found some kind of cause. Martha Washington, having been at camp with the veterans, uh, with the soldiers right. for all those years, became very interested in the veterans. And they would come to see her, and, and she lobbied Congress for veterans benefits for the Revolutionary War veterans. So I think they've all been very engaged. And in those days, the idea that a woman would run for any office, let no. alone president, was never even no. discussed. The only women who could vote, in, in theory, um, in, uh, widows or unmarried women who owned property, in theory, could vote. The place where it was actually um, in the law that women could vote was in New Jersey. Uh, but it, it was New Jersey, and they had, I know it will shock you, a crooked election. Right. And, um, <laughs> And the, the people who lost were upset and blamed it on the women and took away the franchise. So um, this book, which I highly recommend, um, and you will be you? signing it uh, shortly. 
uh, talks about uh, the Civil War period of time, but uh, I would like to take advantage for a few moments before we conclude. You're obviously a very astute political commentator about what's going on in the elections now. Do you have any um, <laughs> things that you can tell us about how you think the election is going and any predictions or <laughs> give us some insights? <laughs> My day job. Um, I mean, I think that I think that we we know who the nominees are going to be unless something happens, um, and um, and I think it's going to be a very hard fought and ugly election, and uh, and I think that anybody who thinks that Donald Trump does not have an excellent chance of becoming president is just not looking at the electoral map. Okay, and uh, you think the. The people that want to have a woman present the first time, that's just not significant enough? No, it might be. Uh, and the combination of the fact that you have um, minorities who traditionally vote Democratic anyway and are more likely to in this election uh, because of some of the statements that Mr. Trump has made. Um, uh, demographically, a Democrat should win. I mean, that's, that's right. where we are. Uh, and women certainly contribute to that. And if the, there's an extra push among white women uh, because they want a woman president, that could be dispositive. But we, we're not seeing that right now. For a number of years, you hosted the, the ABC morning, uh, Sunday morning show with Sam Donaldson. What was Sam Donaldson really like? <laughs> Sam's great. He really is. I mean, the, he's, a, he's a good friend and, and a nice, nice person. But there's no hidden Sam. I mean, what you see is what there is. Uh, it's not like in the background there's a quiet, you know, subdued Sam. Um, he, Sam, you know, still in his 80s, will run up the down escalator. So when you're doing those TV talk shows, I always wonder, when you have these Sunday morning talk shows, you have guests that come on and they come on voluntarily. They're not uh, being forced <laughs> to come on. Why do they come on and not say anything sometimes? What a good question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Because they've been media trained within an inch of their lives, and they, you know, they just want to say those six things that they think is the message they want to get across, and they don't want to say anything else. So, as you look back on your career, you know, you've been a journalist, an author. Um, you know, we've got a lot of things to do. What do you think is the great legacy you'd like your grandchildren, your six grandchildren, to um, know about you? Well, first of all, they're the great legacy, of course, and my and my children. I mean, having raised two really uh, lovely human beings uh, is obviously the most important thing uh, in my life. But um, but I do want them. I, I guess the books really tell the story. I want them to know the story of the other half of the human race and the fact that I helped bring it to life. Okay, and a final question I'd like to ask you about. Uh, Jimmy Carter once said the hardest thing in his life, by far, was the, on, the only thing that almost caused a divorce was writing a book with his wife. <laughs> um, you wrote a book with your husband. What was I that like? It. And we write a weekly newspaper column. Uh, we, we don't write it together, we, but we alternate from time to time. He mostly writes it. We're fine. Um, he, as he always says, we edit each other gently. Uh, and, and if anybody says, I don't want that in there, it's gone. I mean, there's no argument about it. Um, so that, that helps a lot. Um, but it, it really is not, of, of the kinds of you know, things that come up in a marriage, writing together has not been a not problem. the biggest thing. OK. All right. Koki, I want to thank you. For I, wait, I want to say one more thing, David, before okay. I thank you. All right. I bought this jacket in the Historical Society gift shop. OK, all right. Okay. All right. I was here one night and I was freezing and I needed at least one more layer. And so I went into the gift shop, got this jacket, packs beautifully, I tell you, you can check right. it out. All right. <laughs> well, looks great on you. So um, I want to thank you for um, the great history you've done for America by writing these books and also for your great career as a journalist, and thank you for being a great American. Thank, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for all of your many, many times.